Well, without further ado, I'll get to introducing um, our first speaker, uh, Robert Stern. We we're very happy to have with us um, from England. Um, probably doesn't need much of an introduction to this crowd. Um, Bob's been working on Hegel since well since the eighties. He his first book. Um, Hegel, Kant, and the Structure of the Object came out in 1990. And since then, he's published a sort of host of, I think I've count, I count 10 edited books, and then, I don't know, seven or eight monographs, including Transcendental Arguments, um, the Rutledge Guidebook to Hegel and the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegelian Metaphysics, which sort of um, solidified his position as a sort of metaphysics friendly reading of Hegel that he's been an advocate of. His 2011 book, Understanding Moral Obligation, Kant, Hegel, Kierkegaard. And most recently, at least as far as I know, he may have published something already and I didn't find out about it yet, but as far as I know, the most recent one, The Radical Demand in Logstrup's Ethics. Um, and I think there's lots of other things I could say about Bob, but I think I will hand the floor over to him. Thanks very much, Dean. And uh, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. It's great to be able to see everyone. Um, obviously, a shame not to be there in person. Um, and uh, I would obviously like to thank Dean and the other organizers for putting all this together so brilliantly and also to thank Terry who I suppose is our telos or purpose uh, in this in this activity and it's great to be able to honor him and his work in this way I don't think I've never been officially taught by Terry but I certainly learned a huge amount from him and from reading his work so um, it's, it's great to be able to celebrate it in this way so I'm going to do some slides. Um, I'm going to hopefully hit about 20 minutes or so, so not the full amount. And I'm kind of going to assume that not everyone has read the paper, so hopefully the talk will make sense on its own. But obviously there's some material in the paper that I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover exactly, but I hope everything will still make sense. So here I'm sharing the slides. Is that working okay? Dean, I can see, yeah, okay, great, excellent. And I'll just move the photos away so I can read what I've got here. Okay, so yeah, here's the title, um, quote from Hegel. This is the very essence of the Reformation. Man is in his very nature destined to be free, Hegel, Luther, and freedom. So I'm not focusing on the philosophy of right as such, but uh, as a word background to it, hopefully. Um, and this, uh, the context for this talk is that I've become interested in the, the Lutheran background to philosophy broadly, um, but obviously including Hegel. And I hope that it fits with the sort of contextual approach that Terry has championed in his biography of Hegel and obviously in his other writings. And again, that it's appropriate to the volume, this talk, because it focuses on the relation between Hegel and Luther on the question of freedom which is obviously relevant to the philosophy of right. But of course, that means I'm not going to consider other ways one might connect Hegel and Luther. I'm just focusing on the freedom issue. Um, and I'm gonna consider four aspects of that. Um, and th this is just the headings, I'll explain them when I get to them, but religious and social freedom, freedom is grace and reconciliation, freedom is liberation from the law, and freedom as necessity. So starting with religious and social freedom, in some ways this is the most obvious connection to draw between Luther and Hegel. I mean, it's the one he in a way makes most explicit, makes most of. Um, and there are many different writings where he mentions he uh, Luther in, in this connection, but in the paper and, and what I'll just briefly say here, I'm focusing on the rectoral rectoral address on the 300th anniversary of the Augsburg Confession, which Hegel gave in Latin on the 25th of June, 1830. Um, and in that address, just to say briefly, 
Hegel associates the Reformation with various forms of religious and social freedom. Um, he, he mentions in particular that the laity can now comment on religious matters and so are freed from the authority of the clergy and the church. But he also has a kind of, I think, implied criticism of Luther that Luther didn't free the people from the princes. Um, and so he says that, in effect, we need a second reformation at the political social level, writing that if religion is reformed, the political, legal and ethical system should also be reformed. Hegel's also um, on this issue of religious and social freedom, um, critical of Luther in the sense that he suggests that a more rationalistic or philosophical approach is needed to these issues than Luther himself offered. So in the preface to the philosophy of right, he says what Luther inaugurated as faith in feeling and in the testimony of the spirit is the same thing that the spirit at a more mature stage of its development endeavors to grasp in the concept of griff so as to free itself in the present and find itself therein. So we need, in effect, a second Luther to extend the Reformation into social philosophy. Um, and there's no prizes for guessing who Hegel has in mind as uh, the second Luther, namely himself, I reckon. OK, so that's briefly on the first theme. Um, now moving on to the second theme of freedom as grace and reconciliation. So this connects freedom um, to Luther's central conception of grace, which is obviously fundamental to the so-called Reformation breakthrough, crudely summarized in justification through grace rather than through works, which again, uh, crudely summarized means that justification can't be earned through works, through good deeds, through pious deeds and so on, but involves faith or trust in a essentially forgiving God. And it's through giving up this agency, so giving up the agency of works, that we come back to God by finding his forgiveness. He's no longer for Luther seen as an alien judge, so in the famous discussion of the, the so-called tower experience that, that Luther recounts later, Luther pictures himself as shifting from the view of God as one who punishes sinners to the God of mercy who justifies us by faith. So there's a sense I want to suggest here that by giving up agency, uh, freedom is restored but where freedom is now understood as reconciliation to God, who is no longer other as an object of hatred and fear. And in his discussions, Hegel picks up on this structure. Um, so he implicitly refers to Jesus's claim that the truth will set you free. Um, and um, the, then the question is, well, why? Well, one answer, is that the truth Jesus is preaching frees you from works righteousness, so frees you from the kind of anxieties that Luther was gripped by. But also awareness of the truth for Hegel requires us to surrender ourselves to what is being preached if we are to grasp it, but not in a way that amounts to kind of blind obedience because through this process, um, we come to a truth in which we can find ourselves and with which we can identify. So it seems to me for both Luther and Hegel, a certain overcoming of the self is required before the self can find itself again in the relation in which true freedom as reconciliation is to be attained. So here's a passage that seems to me to support this reading from the lectures on philosophy of history. Um, Subjectivity therefore makes the objective content of Christianity, i.e. the doctrine of the church, its own. In the Lutheran church, the subjectivity and the conviction of the individual is regarded as equally necessary as the objectivity of truth. So uh, it's not that you accept this on authority. So that relates back to the freedom of the first part of the discussion. Truth with Lutherans is not a finished and completed thing, but the subject should become a true subject 
surrendering his particular being in exchange for the substantial truth and making that truth his own. And as he puts in a related lecture series, subjective spirit comes to itself through its self-negation because it is absolutely at home with itself. Thus, sub subjective spirit gains freedom in the truth, negates its particularity, and comes to itself in its truth. In this way, Christian freedom is actualized. So there's a kind of surrendering of self uh, here, which nonetheless brings you to a different kind of freedom, which is uh, a finding of yourself in the truth. And I think that structure is reflected in Hegel's method more broadly. And this is something Stephen Hawkeye has discussed. Uh, and there, there are many passages of this kind, but uh, just to look at the one here from the logic, philosophical thinking proceeds analytically in that it simply takes up its object, the idea, and lets it go its own way, while it simply watches the movement and development of it, so to speak. To this extent, philosophizing is wholly passive. So there's a kind of, again, a giving up um, in this process, the kind of giving up that, um, as I said, I think you can find in Luther. But again, it, I think it's not just passive. There's a letting go of the subject, which actually it might be better described as medio passive, um, to use terminology Beatrice Hampile has used. Um, there, is, there is a passive element to it, letting go, um, which is a kind of activity. And, you know, one might ask the same of Luther, whether faith is fully passive or medio passive. But nonetheless, through this process of a kind of letting go, something that involves passivity, you find yourself in the other and hence achieve a, a different kind of freedom, a freedom as reconciliation. So by surrendering freedom on one side, if you want to freedom in the sense of this active agency, you gain freedom of another kind, this sense of reconciliation. And I think you also get freedom in a different but related sense of freedom from being trapped within oneself. So Luther's conception of sin is being uh, curved in on yourself, incubatus in se. Arguably Hegel's conception is sin is a kind of particularity that cuts itself off from the universality and failure to achieve reconciliation feeds this, this internness, this loss of freedom through anger, hatred, and despair, for example. Okay, that was the second theme I wanted to mention. Uh, now to turn to a third theme that I want to connect back to Luther. This concerns um, how Luther saw the relation between the Christian and the law. So Luther, Luther speaks, um, quite widely about the idea of the freedom of the Christian, and in particular, there's a, a well-known text of that name. And Luther has his own doppelsatz, if you like. Um, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Well, what makes uh, a, a Christian a free Lord, first of all? Well, again, roughly, <laughs> I think, the Christian knows that they are forgiven, therefore does not hate the law, but loves it. So then the law loses its kind of coercive power, liberating the Christian from the law in that sense, and then enabling them to love the neighbor who they then will serve. And uh, Luther often associates this idea with his reading of Paul, that the Christian finds true freedom from sin and from the law. And this freedom then arises because the law loses its constraining force, loses its constraining power. And I think now there are parallels then between that idea and Hegel's idea, um, it, particularly in the spirit of Christianity, where um, uh, he discusses, as you'll know, the Sermon on the Mount, and there he sets up a kind of contrast between Kant on the one hand and Jesus on the other. Um, and uh, in this passage here, 
Uh, Hegel says, to complete subjection under the law of an alien lord, Jesus opposed not a particular subjection under a law of one's own, the self-coercion of Kantian virtue, but virtues without lordship and without submission, i.e. virtues as modifications of love. So I think Hegel is saying there that um, Kant has a notion of freedom as self-legislation. Um, but the problem with that view is that law retains its coercive power. Um, so that the, the law uh, remains as something that constrains. Whereas Hegel is, I think, attracted by the more radical thought, and as I said, the thought I would associate with Luther too, that um, the, 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 the ideal is to be not under the law at all, because to love the neighbor is to do so willingly and so without any notion of Kantian necessitation or constraint, not even Kantian self-coercion. So you have, again, this idea of liberation from the law um, as a fundamental connection to the uh, idea of love. Okay, uh, third, uh, sorry, fourthly and finally, just to say something about the theme, what I'm calling freedom as necessity. Um, and this relates to Luther's treatment of freedom in the bondage of the will, uh, de servo arbitrio. Now Hegel never mentions this text as far as I know, um, and he doesn't seem to very often mention Erasmus and not usually in particularly interesting ways. So that might suggest that Hegel didn't know or largely ignored the work, this work, and didn't see anything of much importance in it with regard to freedom and Hegel's own conception of the will. But I want to suggest that perhaps we can find connections if we dig a bit deeper here. So as I'm sure you'll know, Luther's bondage of the will is directed against Erasmus's defense of free will. And in his defense of free will, Erasmus is seeking, on the one hand, to avoid Pelagianism, namely the heresy that we can earn God's grace by doing good works through our own initiative. But, um, and obviously that's, as we're fine with uh, Luther, Hegel, uh, Luther's fine with um, trying to reject Pelagianism. But Erasmus also seeks to defend a limited place for free will and to argue on the basis of various biblical texts, many involving divine commands, that this is supported by scripture. Because why would God command us to do things unless we had the ability to do them? So appealing to, in effect, what implies can. Now, Luther has various arguments uh, against Erasmus's position, um, but the one that I want to focus on here can be sort of set out as follows. First of all, left to itself, the will is unable to form the good, only the bad. Uh, God's grace is needed to perform the good. But then a will that can only perform the bad is not really free to choose, as it really only has one option, namely the bad. Therefore, there is no free will, qua free choice. It can only go in one direction, as it were. But Luther recognizes that Erasmus might respond to that argument by saying, well, look, isn't there still a point at which the will might choose whether to go along with God's grace and so opt for the good as opposed to the bad? So isn't there still a point at which it can choose between good and bad, even if it will need God's help to actually attain the good. So isn't there, as it were, a neutral space um, where the will has the capacity to choose? And I think Luther's response to that kind of argument is Augustinian, um, and he refers to Augustine explicitly when he writes that fr that free choice, that the free choice that Erasmus might appeal to, avails for nothing but sinning, which is why Augustine calls it an enslaved rather than a free choice. And Luther refers to this uh, comment in Augustine's spirit and the letter, 
A man's free will indeed avails for nothing except to sin if he knows not the way of truth. So I think the sort of dilemma here is either the agent knows the way of truth, but then there's no room for choice as you just follow that way, or they do not know the way of truth, so can only sin, but there's still no room for choice because you're only going in one direction. So against Erasmus, Luther argues that, quote, it's a mere dialectical fiction that there is in man a neutral and unqualified willing, end quote. As if this somehow gave the will the capacity to stand back and choose between the good and the bad. Because to stand back in this way is to no longer follow the good and hence to be bad. So there is no neutral position. Now, I think something like that thought plays a role in Hegel's thinking too. So here's a passage from the lectures on the philosophy of religion, which uh, I think parallels some of these Lutheran ideas. So Hegel says, in reference particularly to the statement that the will, villa, is free choice, willkür, which can will good or evil, it may be remarked that as a matter of fact, Free choice is not will. It is will only in so far as it comes to a decision, for in so far as it still might will one thing or another, it is not will. So uh, like Luther, um, Hegel is drawing a distinction between the will and free choice. And the will only comes into action once things are already settled, once um, it's clear what is to be done, the will then brings that about. Um, but there is no room in this story for free choice, for willkür, and those are two different things. So why is there no room for free choice? Well, here's a kind of, re again, reconstruction of an argument. First of all, the rational will is guided by what is rational to do. And what is rational to do is determined or settled by what the, re what the agent has most reason to do. So what the agent has most reason to do is settled by the intellect, not the will. Therefore, what is rational to do leaves the will with no room for free choice about what to do. Therefore, the agent who acts, exercises free choice is failing to be a properly rational agent and so not acting freely. So here's a passage, uh, uh, again, from the philosophy of right, a, a well-known passage, which I think relates to this set of ideas. Hegel says, the ordinary person thinks he is free if it is open for him to act by exercising free choice. But precisely this free choice means he is not free. When I will what is rational, then I act not as a particular individual, but in accordance with the concepts of ethical life in general. In an ethical action, I do not assert myself, but follow the matter at hand. But in doing a perverse action, it is my particularity uh, that I bring onto the center of the stage. The rational is the high road, where everyone travels, where no one is conspicuous. If you stop at the consideration that having a free choice, a human being can will this or that, then of course his freedom consists in this ability. But if you keep firmly in mind, uh, in view, that the content of willing is a given one, then he is determined thereby, and in this very respect, no longer free. So, I think the argument is, the idea is, freedom does not consist in free choice. Freedom consists in willing what's rational, which needs no room for free choice. If you insist on trying to exercise free choice, then you're turning away from what is rational and hence universal to focus on particularity instead, which I think is, as it were, is the Hegelian version of sin. And Hegel has this sort of uh, nice uh, analogy, as it were, with two kinds of artists, the artist who wants to see us to see their personality in the artwork versus the one who just follows what is determined by the artwork itself. So if choice is operative in a rationally determined situation, 
it in fact only goes one way towards the bad and so again it's not really free just to briefly add a, a couple of uh, riders on this first of all i think hegel's position is still compatible with the view that reason may leave some options open so there may be some room for willkür and in the modern state as those choices may define aspects of our identity individuals should be left to exercise these choices so uh, in the philosophy of right that is treated as an important part of our political freedom and also the free agent can still decide to be evil on this account not because they can choose independently of reason because then i think on this account they wouldn't be free because willkür isn't part of freedom but because they can find evil to be a reason to act contrary to guise of the good arguments which say we can never find evil to be a reason and then we can be culpable for acting on that basis so there is some room for willkür in hegel's story but i think hegel uh, like luther still doesn't want to say this is real freedom because it doesn't involve the thinking will as he calls it where the thinking will precisely takes away this kind of neutral space that Villecourt might occupy. So there's, I think, a fundamental parallel between Luther's dilemma for libero arbitrio and Hegel's for Villecourt. On Luther's dilemma, either the agent knows the way of truth, but then there's no room for choice, as just follow that way, uh, that's, that's what the agent will do. There's just voluntas, not libero arbitrio or they do not know the way of truth so can only sin so there's also no room for choice because you're only going in one direction namely the bad and hegel's dilemma might be put this way either the will is guided by reasons in which case the will does no choosing as it just follows reason there's just villa no willkür or the will goes against reason but then there's also no room for choice as it only goes in one direction, namely towards the bad. So that's to try and spell out the parallels as I see them. Okay, so to just very quickly sum up, I've gone through these four aspects of freedom in that, that seem to me to connect um, Luther and Hegel, religious and social freedom, freedom as grace and reconciliation, freedom as liberation from the law, freedom as necessity, uh, why is this perhaps of any interest? Well, first of all, it might shed a bit more light on the issue of what is Hegel's relation to Luther, which has been uh, discussed somewhat. But also, I hope maybe it might provide a different context for some of Hegel's arguments and claims and perhaps suggest different ways in which his arguments can be assessed. Thanks very much. Good, thank you. Great, thank you, Val. Um, all right, yeah, we have half an hour for questions. So the floor is open and I see uh, Chris Yeomans. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. This is really interesting and I um, appreciate the, uh, the, the attempt to, to connect to Luther uh, and to provide that kind of context. Um, uh, I guess my, uh, so I read the paper and a lot of my initial reactions uh, that I thought of as uh, knockdown refutations of your view, you then presented at the end of your talk as qualifications. And so I guess I wanted, you know, that, that there's still some room for Vilcour, um and uh i forget exactly how you put it but that um there's still that there's uh you talked about there being some room for vilcour even within the rational that there's these important aspects of political freedom that seem to involve um uh using vilcour and so i i guess what i wanted to push you on is why doesn't that show that vilcour is an essential part of free will that these passages where hegel's trying to distinguish Vilcour from free will essentially just have the force of saying 
look, this is a common view. People think it's just free choice. But look, if you stick to that, you, you really don't have the free will, right? Um, uh, and so, so that was just sort of one question that I had. And then the second question, I guess, is sort of a worry that um, the analogy that you want to draw with Luther trades on a fairly hard distinction between intellect and will or reason and will. And, uh, right, it seems to me Luther's got that distinction, but it doesn't seem to me that Hegel's got that distinction, where the will really is just the practical side and the intellect is the theoretical side and its whole reason. Anyway, I'll just stop there. Thanks. Interesting. Good. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I, I want to allow that um, Hegel, there is space for something called Willkür. Um, the question is, do we want to call that freedom? Um, and I mean, in a way you, you can, if you want, <laughs> um, but I mean, do, do we want to give any um, particular uh, value to it as, as a form of freedom? Um, and I think in, in so far as the will isn't being guided by reason, um, not in a problematic way, because there, as I say, it, it, it becomes possible because there is no reason to be had here. The reason has left it open. But insofar as it's not being guided by reason, then, well, it, it, yeah, it, it seems to me Hegel's view is that in the end it loses its, its status as true freedom. Um, I mean, one way of putting it is that it is left as kind of arbitrary. Um, and not really a choice at all. And again, that's how Hegel often puts it. Um, but as I said, yeah, in my qualifying comments, um, that doesn't mean to say that there's not a reason to keep that as a freedom at the political level, um, precisely because by making these arbitrary choices, uh, we can come to define ourselves in certain ways. Um, and, and that, that seems to me to give it its place. Um, I don't know if that, yeah, I'm not sure if that addresses your worry, but that's how I'm thinking about it at least. On the reason and will um, distinction, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think there is a distinction um, or reason and int, uh, yeah, intellect and will distinction. I mean, in a sense, I don't think there is a distinction, Hegel, that's the point, um, that they should be internet, uh, intimately interconnected. That's the idea of the thinking will. Uh, but nonetheless, as it were, it can be talked about in terms of two aspects, um, uh, and, and one can think how they interrelate. But I, I wouldn't want to, yeah, I hope I didn't give the impression of thinking that Hegel thought of them as separate. I mean, it's precisely because he doesn't think that they're separate, that he has the kind of picture he does, I think. Again, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, maybe um, just for time's sake, we can either you can either ask two questions or one question and a follow up, but no more than that, or we're going to run out of time. Um, Jay Bernstein. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Great to see so many old friends. Uh, great to be here to celebrate uh, everything that Terry has done for Hegel Scholarship and our intellectual life together. Um, and, and always uh, challenged by Bob Stern. Um, I want to really press hard on Christopher Yeoman's questions about dualism as the problem here. Because, of course, it was Kant who tried to introduce spontaneity and therefore activity into reason. And you, in fact, go very passive very early on. Um, you talk about all this, you know, the giving up and the passivity, that line, and it seems to me that's where you return to. So my way of asking the questions, um, isn't there an assumed dualism, first of all, between reason and will, but above all, between passive and active, and thirdly, what makes it seem to me to matter between indeterminacy and determinacy. That is figuring out what to do, what the right inference is, how we should think is not a mere seeing, right? That's, that's the Cartesian mistake. Um, 
uh, mental activity is a figuring out where the assumption is, is there isn't a simple right answer or very rarely just logic and mathematics. And if there isn't a right answer, how can it be passive in the way that this is presenting it, right? So of course, we want some notion of, of, of getting that notion of necessity right. But I take it that Hegel's conception of reason is constructivist, not platonic. Um, and therefore the activity of constructing the pathways, uh, working out the inferences, can't be passive in the way that you seem to be thinking of it. That is, it seems to me you're tacitly going back to a perceptual conception of seeing the logical linkages, a la Descartes. So that's, that's the worry. I don't see how you respond. And I take it that's what Christopher was worried about. Um, and yeah, I wanna just push that thought a little further. Yeah, good. So no, that's exactly not the picture I, I had in mind. So I've obviously, <laughs> just, you know, failed to convey it properly. Um, so, uh, the the claim so there is a distinction between practical reason and villa so in that sense uh, there is a kind of dualism in the picture but i don't want to say practical reason itself is wholly passive but insofar as as activity within practical reason it's not willkür right so there is no place for willkür in that story but i totally agree with you i mean that's again why I think in the, the philosophy of you know subjective spirit, there's a there's a there's a sort of seamless link from the, th the theoretical to the practical, precisely for the reasons you're giving that there's a kind of agency involved in thinking, um, but it's not the agency of willkür, it's not the agency of free choice, um, and so and and that's that's the kind of freedom that I think Luther is rejecting and that I. I, I would say Hegel is also rejecting, while agreeing with you that there's a kind of agency involved in, um, in thinking. But it's not how, really good, right? But, it's but not how free is, choice. How is making determinate not involve spontaneity, which is what Villecourt depends on? Well, because um, you're, you're guided by reasons in your reasoning, right? Um, you don't you don't i mean spontaneity can't well let's leave kant aside but i don't think it can mean just randomly chucking stuff together for fun right um and so in that sense there's not this kind of free choice unguided by reasons so when you use um your when you're active in your thinking you're inquiring, right? You're, you're um, being guided by reasons to think one way and the other. So again, it's not willkür. Um, there is no place in the structure for this idea of a kind of pure choosing. That's, that's what I'm rejecting, but I'm not, I didn't mean, well, yeah, uh, I, I mean, it's not your fault, it's my fault, but I don't mean to say that uh, the process of thinking itself is somehow wholly passive. And again, I didn't more broadly mean to say everything is passive. I mean, as I mentioned, when talking about the other topic of grace and so on, there's, there's argue, arguably media passivity there, not just straight passivity and so on. But, but thank you. I have, again, I have, well, <laughs> it's the frustration of Zoom that you can't really tell if anyone believes anything <laughs> you're saying to them. But anyway, right. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, uh, Lydia, go. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes. yes. I, I, um, I'm puzz puzzled um, in your argument as to when, in your use, actually in your text also, of when you keep talking about free choice. Sometimes you mean the free freedom of the willing. Sometimes by free choice, you actually mean arbitrary choice. Mm. And of course, there's not going to be a role for the arbitrariness of choice. But that doesn't mean there won't be a kind of choosing which is in accord with the freedom of the willing. So he uses, word, uh, Hegel uses the word caprice, mm. 
an arbitrariness um, in there's several times when you note that in quotations as in footnote 20. Um, but you tend to translate arbitrary choice, uh, capricious choice as free choice um, in the text. And so the argument becomes confused because of that, because we say there is room from a genuine freedom. But what really do you mean when you say when where it's not arbitrary or capricious? But when you say free choice, what do you have in mind? So, uh, as I say, either the choice is determined by what you have most reason to do, in which case there is no choice. Yes, but I would say the choice there, as in your proviso, is that the choice would be in accordance with the reason or the rationality and therefore would not be a problem. But say there's no choice means as um, we don't want to give space but, to- But what do you mean? What, what, what could you mean by that? So now you're, it sounds like you're saying, uh, Even, we, we're presented with reason and now you can exercise a choice whether to go along with reason or not. Yes. Uh, well, again- I mean, it might, it might deflate the notion of choice. But it doesn't make, and I think the idea is it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> because what, on what grounds are you going to make the choice to go along with reason? Either by following reason, in which case there's no choice to be had, or it's just this capricious choice. You're, you're going against what you have reason to do. So, so the only place where choice is possible is when there's no reason, there is no reason to go one way or the other, right? then you can use willkür. Um, but otherwise, there's no space for it. What's so it doing? <laughs> so reason is fully dictating of the actions one then um, performs. So there's no choices that are in accord with the reasons given. No yeah. space for choice there's, at all. There's saying. no space for it. Where would it, where would it be? <laughs> I thought there was still some space according to the proviso of your argument, but no, okay. there, is, there only is where reason leaves it open, you know, so if I've got no reason, more reason to choose chocolate ice cream over vanilla ice cream, yeah, just use Willkür, take your pick, doesn't really matter. But where there is a reason, more reason to do one thing than another, in the rational free agent, there's no room for Willkür, it, it can't do anything. The only thing it can do is turn you against reason. <laughs> But then okay. that's not free either because you're just willing the bad. It only takes you in the direction of sin, to put it in Lutheran terms. Okay, so free choice always means arbitrary or capricious choice in your book. Yeah, and I may or, have to check the or, translations. Different translators do it different ways um, and I should certainly be consistent. But uh, yeah, but I think I normally try and give Willkür just, you know, whichever the translation is. is yeah, because that. it's barely in Hegel's actual language. I had a quick look to see if Hegel used that. So it might be worth checking that at least. Well, it's so a the translation of Willkür and, tra and Willkür goes back to, well, arbitrio, which is the, so partly related to notions of the arbitrary, right? That's where it comes it from. I always so. put arbitrary or capricious choice, but not free choice, because right. I think the word free uh, connotes something different and confuses the argument. It's really a question about translation here. Anyway, I'll Thank as you. many people I want. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks. Well, we have 15 minutes and six hands, so um, try to keep it relatively short. Um, Thomas Karana. Uh, well, thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Great. Um, all right, so um, I really enjoyed the paper and um, I was very sympathetic to the first three points uh, and just wanted to say in, in terms of the passivity, I thought it's really important to stress the aspect of this medio passivity that you were pointing to in the sense in which it's not just the mere seeing of something that's given, but the passivity that is required is my being receptive to the activity of reason and to the movement of the concept. So it's not a not a not a mere passivity where I receive something given, but where where I make myself perceptive to some some determination that's that's going on. 
And, and if, if you put it like that, then I can see uh, that it's really pertinent to what, what he would also do. But I had huge problems with the fourth point um, that we have been talking about now in terms of Willkür. And I wanted to ask you what you make of the um, of the three moments of freedom that Hegel starts the philosophy of right with, um, and and mainly the first moment, the, the, the freedom of indeterminacy. It seems that the, Hegel believes that in order for freedom to to come into the picture at all, I have to have the capacity to make myself indeterminate, to abstract from every determination I find myself in, or I have posited. So even the things that I have posited with reason, I need to need to be able to step back from, abstract from, and make myself fully indeterminate. And only from there on, I can rebuild my true freedom. This true freedom won't be just arbitrary choice, clearly, it has to be something else, but it involves, it involves this indeterminacy. And in your picture of Luther, and also you now rehearse that, that there, there is no moment in which, in which choice can even arise, in, in which this can even be a topic. So I, I'm wondering whether you do not need to bring in this indeterminacy in Hegel's case, and whether that not makes a big difference with regard to your interpretation of Luther. Thanks. Mm. Thanks. So, okay. I mean, yeah, maybe we partly we just read <laughs> those paragraphs slightly differently and, and, you know, what's going on there. But um, I think that, um, well, one way of putting it is I, I think that's to read it perhaps undialectically. I mean, so it's not that there's a first moment uh, sort of in time where you you step back and then, you know, something else follows from that and so on. I mean, I think Hegel's wanting to say none of those three moments of universal, particular and individual make any sense on their own, right? So in that sense, there is no, precisely there is no indeterminacy. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. It's something you might think of as freedom, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> and, and you'd precisely be wrong for the reasons I think I'm suggesting, right? That, that this notion of pure indeterminacy is completely empty. And of course, that's why you move to something more like, you know, particularity, which gives you some determinacy and so on. So, yeah, I suppose, I mean, would it be one answer to you to say, um, <laughs> well, in a way, I'm taking it to mean the opposite. I'm taking it to be in support of my view, precisely because it breaks down dialectically, right? Right. So your, your, your position would make sense if it was stable, but obviously it isn't. It can't be. But it, if it is one of the moments, it's true, we, you can't take it on its own, isolated. There is not this moment of indeterminacy. But if it's yeah. one of the moments of freedom that only in the, in, as, a, as a whole do allow for the realization of freedom, there is an element or moment of indeterminacy involved in it. And it seems that Luther has no appreciation for that at all. Right, so it's a, I mean, all we have would have to be constructed differently, such that it is an essential moment of our human freedom that this can happen to us, that we, yeah. we fall prey to this. So maybe there's, there's room for that. I mean, the other thing I would say is I don't read universality as indeterminacy. So I read, I guess I read that first section as something a bit more Kantian, that we can always step back from our interests, our concerns, our projects, etc and think freely in that sense. And that's actually a kind of reason, right? I mean, that's, that's a positive thing in Hegel's story. That, that that's what, you know, reason, I mean, in the quote that I gave from the philosophy of right, right? The, the rational is the high road where we all travel. That's the notion of universality, I think, going on there. Namely, stepping back from our particularity, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I said, I think probably in the end, we just read those paragraphs differently <laughs> to begin with. And, you know, I guess we're not going to settle that here. Um, but I, I, that, I mean, I certainly will go away and think about that as a, you know, as a challenge and look at the text again, as, you know, as of all the comments have, have been challenging in that way. But is that all right Very for now, good. Thomas? I mean, given all we can do. <laughs> Um, Sebastian. Um, thanks for the paper. Um, <clears throat> so because of the role of grace in faith, right, it seems mm -hmm. that there's a possibility in Luther's perspective that it, I might do all there is, <clears throat> sorry, I might do all there is for me to do, however much that turns out to be, um, without success, in other words, without thereby being saved. 
uh, and, and not because of a flaw in me, which I might be capable of changing. Um, do you take it that in, in Hegel's view, there's a parallel possibility in the case of reconciliation with actuality? In other words, that the subject might, you know, let's say, do all the subject can do to, you know, let's say, let go of herself and reconcile herself and yet not be reconciled and not because the society itself is, is flawed, because the parallel here would be that the society is like God, God, you know, in this Lutheran picture is not flawed. Like, so do you think that that possibility is open in the Hegelian, um, you know, uh, irreligious version of the model? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm, I hadn't quite thought of it uh, in those terms, so I'm not immediately sure how best to reply. I mean, so of course Luther's model is precisely to get away from the anxiety you've just had, right? Um, so your worry was precisely works righteousness. You know, I'm doing all this stuff, but is it working? And Luther's model of grace is to is to free you from that. You don't you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. <laughs> You're forgiven anyway, right? Um, but but I do have to get my mind right about that, don't I? Well, it's, it's I mean, exactly that depends how you read Luther. I would say yeah. no. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Um, that that's precisely how you're freed from your anxieties. That, that, that forgiveness is totally gratuitous and nothing to do with any of the things that you do. Um, now there is a, a you know big question about what role does then faith play in that little story? But I mean, I guess we, yeah, <laughs> I, I'd love to talk about Luther for a long time, but I guess we can't do that. But it's more now a question of how, what's the parallel in the Hegel story? Um, and yeah, maybe that's where the analogy doesn't quite, you know, doesn't exactly fit. Um, the, the way I want to draw with the analogy was um, on, on, the, on the Lutheran side, there's a giving up of activity, you know, forget works, don't, you know, just give up your agency. And then the worry is, well, how on earth can that be freedom, right? Isn't giving up your agency a loss of freedom? And then the answer is, well, no, you're getting this freedom as reconciliation instead which is, is a higher form of freedom and is again, not entirely passive uh, uh, to, to forestall um, Jay's worries. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, you, you've given up agency in one form to, to regain freedom in another. And that was the parallel I, want, I was thinking works with Hegel, that there's a giving, uh, well, as Thomas said, helpfully, you know, there's a giving up of yourself in a medio passive way to the truth there is a kind of passivity there. Does that mean you're losing your agency as, a, as, a, as an inquirer, as it were? Well, no, partly because it's media passive, but partly because you're getting a, a kind of freedom through reconciliation. Um, anyway, that's just to repeat what I said. I don't think it's to address- Well, do you worries. think, I mean, you know, the, the, the problem would be that in, in Luther, it seems like I can, I can give it up and yet not, be saved. Now, whether that means I'm anxious or not is another matter, but I can, I can give up whatever it is that Luther wants me to give up, but God's grace, you know, God does not give his grace to me. And so I am not saved. And that's just like, and there's nothing I can do about that. Well, right? that's, that's the point about faith, not works. I, I take it. And so my question is in, in Hegel, can I give up whatever I'm supposed to give up and yet still not receive the reconciliation, you know, that's supposed to not exactly. Yeah. Float I mean, that. again, the, what you said about Luther is very, you know, debatable, what, yeah, hot, a hot topic of debate. But leave, but what you say about Hegel, if, I mean, if you just ask me the question, do I think that Hegel thinks that this project um, of um, uh, a sort of, yeah, giving up of the self to the logic is guaranteed some kind of success? Um, I, I think he probably does think that, to be honest. <laughs> um, I'm not sure on what grounds exactly, but I think he, he thinks that, I, I mean, maybe because he thinks that, again, it's, it's us that gets in the way of, of our perception of truth. If we can just get ourselves out of the way, it will work, right? Um, and we're the ones that are standing between us and truth. And, and that, that would be a rather, again, maybe I'm overthinking the Luther here, but that would be a, a very Lutheran way of putting it, that we're the, you know, God forgives us 
whatever but we we can get we can not necessarily prevent that forgiveness but we can certainly make ourselves feel we've lost that forgiveness and get in the way in that sense and if we can just get out of the way <laughs> then then all will be well um i think that's i don't know what others would think here <laughs> be, again it'd be wonderful if we could actually have a discussion but uh yeah I, i'm i'm not i'm sort of reasonably attracted to that as a reading of hegel thanks we should uh, go on to a couple more questions. I don't want to go much over time. Um, Paul Redding. Hi, Paul. Okay. Um, thanks, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Um, it's great to see you. Um, my, um, my, I think my questions are sort of follow on from Jay's and it's about the sort of internal inferential structure of action. Um, I, I'm having trouble seeing how choice can be um, eliminated in the sense that there is, mustn't there always be a question of choice among competing, as it were, means for achieving the good? I mean, you know, I mean, our actions a good agent will want to act in a way that is good right so that the, something good is achieved but there is just so many sort of pathways that are opened up by that and how do we i mean you know i mean isn't choice there or, well yeah so i'm mean, an I, inelim I, ineliminable type of factor yeah, so as I said, I didn't want to say that um, there's no place for choice for, for Willeke in, in Hegel's story, and there will be precisely for the reasons that you give, that reasons don't always determine what's best to do. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's right. Um, that, that Sounds to me like a massive place for choice, not just a little bit. Of a place well, there's there's a lot of it, or maybe I mean that that's a, of course a debatable question. How much reason does leave open? Um, I mean, you know, I mean, on, yeah, there's one tradition that says basically. Well, I mean, Leibniz, who's coming out of the same Lutheran tradition, thinks it's never there. There is no. Um, there is no liberty of indifference, but precisely because there are no cases where reason leaves it open. Um, I mean, I don't think Hegel's as kind of committed to the project as that. Um, so there, there is Vilcour, there is a, you know, yeah, Vilcour goes on. <laughs> um, but only when, um, yeah, only in, in limited circumstances in the sense that when reason uh, there are there is no reason to do one thing rather than another there is then you know an open question how many cases there are like that i mean as i say arguably very few um i mean the case you've just sketched you know you're trying to work out what to do well yeah i mean that hasn't in itself settled that there's no one right option i mean maybe there isn't maybe there are true dilemmas and so on maybe there are truly open questions but yeah, but I, I mean, it's not an argument about quantity, as it were. <laughs> um, it's an argument about whether in that case we want to say those are the cases of freedom and Hegel certainly doesn't, right? Um, well, we're at time, okay, so I should probably, I think maybe one more question if I can get Stephen Holgate in here. And I think that is gonna have to be the last one. We already have a short lunch break today and I don't want to cut into it too much. So Stephen who will get. Um, okay, very briefly, thanks Bob. Um, obviously I'm deeply sympathetic to your position, but I just wanted to suggest <clears throat> one way you could respond it perhaps to uh, Jay's very pertinent question about possible dualism. Uh, and that is just to note not only that for, for both 
Hegel and Luther that, that passivity is medio passive, as you put it, but that it also issues in activity. That, mm. that, that there isn't a contrast between works and faith in Luther because faith issues in works. The point is that yes. if, you, if you try and base everything on works, you're not going to succeed. The way to succeed through works is through faith for Luther. And it's very, very similar in a way with, with Hegel that the ethical, the surrender uh, to what one does, if you like, empowers one not just to want to do the good, but to do the good. Um, and the other... Yes, uh, no, well, the that's, other... uh, that's the Doppelsatz that, you know, Luther's yeah. Doppelsatz, the freedom of the Christian is, yeah, that you're then free to love the neighbour and do, do good works in that yeah. sense. But, because but that, often free... gets, that often gets overlooked. And I yeah. think, I can't remember if it's Marcuse, who thinks that basically Luther, what Luther's doing is retreating inwards, which, which couldn't be more wrong. The other dualism that, 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 that Hegel... Uh, is un, undoing it seems to me and Luther as well is between law and love that yeah. law doesn't get uh, lo love doesn't get rid of the law it empowers you to fulfill the law yeah uh, no well that's yeah. right well that was the the freedom as as being um, liberated from the law uh, idea exactly that, that but love... you could say it's liberated from the law to the law well or at least uh, I mean to do that, that way but it's again love a good without this kind of constraining yeah. Kantian um, yeah. element that, that Hegel's... See, I mean, when I read those passages originally in um, The Spirit of Christianity, I thought, oh, this is Hegel being a sort of romantic philosopher of a broad kind, um, and because I, I didn't know anything about Luther at that point. And uh, again, I, I, you know, I don't think that's the source. I think it's this, as you say, this Lutheran source um, in that way. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thanks, Stephen. All right. Well, I'm I'm sorry we didn't get Ellen Bredner and uh, Jake McNulty, and I'd love to hear those questions. But I'm trying to keep uh, keep us on time, so let's much. just uh, thank uh, Bob Stern for a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks.